Hi everyone, welcome and thank you for tuning in to today's Facebook Live. April is Autism Acceptance Month, so today we will be talking about the evaluation and assessment process for children with autism spectrum disorder. And once your child does get that diagnosis, if that's the case, what, it, what is the intervention process and what does that look like and what therapies and services are available? So to talk about all of that today, we are joined by the wonderful child and adolescent psychologist, Dr. Leanna Nadi and Dr. Lasser. So if you have any questions for them, we will be answering those live. So just leave those in the comments below and we will try to get to those. So first of all, Dr. Nadi and Dr. Lasser, just introduce yourself and uh, give an overview of your role here at Auctioner. Dr. Nadi, we'll start with you. Hi, I'm Dr. Nadi. I'm a licensed psychologist and I'm also the coordinator of the Autism Assessment Clinic. So I really lead the evaluations for autism, especially in the younger children, ages two through four, where they come through the clinic. And then for older children, I'll see them five through 18 to do the diagnosis. Dr. Lasser, how are you? Uh, my name is Dr. Lasser, and I am a licensed psychologist and licensed behavior analyst here at the Bow Center. Um, most of my time is spent working and providing behavior therapy to individuals with autism and other related disabilities um, here in clinic and then um, sometimes in community settings and schools. I also coordinate our foundation program for prevention and progress that's really geared towards providing education and information about how harmful behaviors can develop in really young individuals and giving families some strategies and support for how they can prevent them from starting in the first place. Place, or to prevent them from becoming something that's more severe later on. Great. Well, it is a pleasure having you guys here today. So we'll start pretty broad. What is autism spectrum disorder? Can you define it for our viewers? Sure. Autism spectrum disorder is a neurodevelopmental disorder, meaning something happens in the early formation of the brain, which can be in utero to the first couple of years of life. Um, the challenges that are faced are typically in reciprocal social interaction and social communication, as well as more restricted and repetitive behaviors that can be seen as some of the more common ones, flapping their hands or um, twisting or flipping their fingers to sensory sensitivities where they can be hyper or hypo, meaning feeling too much or not feeling enough or not sensing enough or sensing too much when it comes to like loud sounds or, you know, tasting and sniffing everything. Uh, so it's these kinds of challenges that can impact children in their day-to-day -day life, but also remembering it's a spectrum. So you might see more repetitive, challenging behaviors and pretty good language skills or you might see more challenges in language where they could be nonverbal or mainly using nouns and labeling objects or being more echolalic, which means repeating things that they hear uh, to, as I said, precocious language skills. And same thing with the behaviors. It's a range from, you know, it could be hand flapping and rocking back and forth to having very high restrictive interest in Disney World and being able to name all the resorts throughout the world and all the magic mirrors and, you know, those limitations in a joint reciprocal conversation. And, and I think it's important to remember too about the different symptoms and signs of autism that uh, we have to take these into consideration within the realm of development in general, because sometimes these symptoms are things that you see in typical development anyway. What's really important though, and what sets it apart as a symptom of autism is that it's, it's a, a more intense form of the behavior. The pattern of behavior is just more intense or severe than what you might see in typical development. And so keeping that in mind, everything when you're looking at an autism spectrum disorder really has to be couched within the framework of what typical development looks like. That's I a really good point, a Dr. Lister. Sorry, yeah, they all agree. Good, good point. point. <laughs> I think Dr. Lasayer brings up a big point because 
one thing I hear a lot when families come to me is they're parallel playing. They're just playing next to a child and not with the child. And then it gets into, well, how old is your child? Because parallel play is actually a typical developmental milestone for creating play skills and developing play relationships. Yeah, and I think another really good example is, you know, someone who has a child who hasn't met all of their language milestones and maybe isn't speaking very much or isn't doesn't have the same vocabulary as another kid. That doesn't necessarily mean that your child has autism, correct? Correct. That's one thing, you know, when we are doing an evaluation and a child comes in with language delays, that's one part we're trying to tease out is is this a language delay or is this autism? Because children with language delays can sometimes be referred in for an autism evaluation. And the way I think about it is think about a silent movie. So we're looking at those social pragmatic communication skills. Even with delayed language, I should still be able to have a social relationship the child's still using eye contact, gestures, body language to communicate their needs. So even though I might have a hard time understanding what they're saying, we're still relating to each other. I still understand the intent. We're still having a shared experience. And so that really gets to the core difference between what a language delay and autism is. Gotcha. So you've touched on this a little bit, but when you are evaluating a child for autism spectrum disorder, walk me through what that appointment looks like with you guys. So at the Bow Center in the Autism Assessment Clinic, it's about a two hour appointment where we do a medical evaluation to rule out, are there any medical contributing factors? Are there any other co-occurring physical neurological issues that need to be considered? hearing issues, vision issues, if genetics needs to be involved, to a speech evaluation, speech and language evaluation, and a psychological evaluation so that we're looking at, is this a language disorder, mixed expressive receptive language delay versus core deficits and social communication? And then that psychological component, looking at social communication and repetitive and restricted behaviors. And We'll talk more about joint attention, but that shared experience. Uh, And then in that evaluation, we also look at cognitive ability. In cognitive ability, we are very careful about the measures we use because we know children with autism, especially if they have language delays, the language could interfere with really demonstrating their knowledge, their cognitive ability, their problem solving skills. So we tend to choose measures at this younger age that pull out the language skills so that we can look at problem solving skills without language really detracting from that. Then in that appointment, the team comes together, we collaborate, we talk, everyone discusses their findings, what do we think the treatment recommendations are, And we will share a diagnosis at the appointment if we feel it's appropriate. And then we'll also go through treatment recommendations and making the referrals. So one week after our appointment, our social worker meets with the family to help discuss this. What were the recommendations? And then how do we connect you to the recommendations so that you can make that next step? Gotcha. So at what age can you start to monitor for those signs of autism spectrum disorder? And kind of at what age would you expect the symptoms to present if your child does have autism? So it's definitely one of those things that I never, I I feel like it's never too early to start monitoring for potential developmental delays in general. Um, We know that signs of autism can begin to be reliably observed in kids as young as 12 months. Um, And so you want to be sure you're familiar with those developmental milestones, keeping in mind that there is a range where these behaviors tend to emerge or or whatnot. Not everybody is exactly as those milestones kind of present. 
Um, but it's important to, to be vocal about your concerns because it's really never too early to start monitoring. And I know for me personally, with my own children, I started monitoring as early as five or six weeks because that's when purposeful behavior really starts to occur in development. That's when you start to see infants really use their eye contact to regulate those interactions that Dr. Anadi was talking about. That's when you start to see that purposeful behavior of looking at somebody in their face and then following them. You start to see very purposeful social smiling in response to what other people are saying to you. So in all honesty, there's never um, too soon. It's never too soon to get started in monitoring for development. I think it's important um, that if you have those concerns, really bring it to your pediatrician, bring it to other people and discuss it because then that'll help to lead to intervention if it's needed. To piggyback from the evaluation standpoint, um, we expect things like eye contact, vocalizations, and gestures to be smoothly coordinated by 18 months of age. But then we start assessing and evaluating at the Autism Assessment Clinic at two years. And the reason we do that is to give you a six month window to really start to differentiate, is this a delay or is this a qualitative difference? Right, understandable. So how important is it to get that early intervention? Let's say if, you know, at two years old, they do get a diagnosis. How important is it that you caught this early and then are able to um, start therapy? So early so intervention. Early... Sorry. Early... Go ahead, Sorry. Dr. Early intervention is crucial. Uh, the earlier you get the diagnosis, the better. And the reason we want a diagnosis, it's the point is not to label. The point is to accurately identify what are the weaknesses and challenges so that we can determine the appropriate treatments. In the earlier years of life, the brain is more plastic. It's more malleable. It's still developing. So it's such a rich time to get in, give some treatment to help the brain develop and develop new pathways and maybe alter the neurotransmitter flow. Uh, so the earlier, the better. And we find that children who receive early intervention, their prognosis is better to the point that the research is showing anywhere from three to 25% of children may actually drop off the spectrum, meaning they no longer qualify for the diagnosis after receiving interventions. And as Dr. Anadi said, the reality is that you really want to start intervention as soon as possible so that you can really begin to address and disrupt these patterns of behavior that can really interfere with later learning. And so the goals during intervention are really meant to help a child to be, or a person to be as independent as possible at their give, given developmental level. And oftentimes early intervention can really help to open up additional opportunities for children on the spectrum because it helps them to learn these really necessary foundational skills that helps them to, to participate in their natural settings as they continue to get older. It hope, opens up opportunities for them to learn in their typical classroom setting. It can help them to be um, participants at birthday parties and to really begin to interact with their peers. And so the, the early intervention process um, oftentimes can also help to identify these different challenging behaviors that can sometimes occur with, uh, within kids on the spectrum. And the earlier you can identify those challenging behaviors, the better, because we know that the, the longer a behavior occurs, the more difficult it is to address later on, um, just based on the history that a person has with that behavior. So the, the primary goal is to really kind of scaffold and provide the foundation um, of skills that are going to be so critical for social learning and, and really engaging and taking advantage of the ability to participate in everyday life. And the goal is always to just help the person meet their fullest potential. Absolutely. So what are some of those therapies that can help with that and kind of how do they help in everyday life or to mitigate some of those challenging behaviors that you're talking about? 
So there are tons of therapies that are promoted for autism spectrum disorders. In fact, this morning I did a quick Google search and I just typed in autism treatment and I got back almost 200 million hits on Google. That is insane. And, you know, how do families start to really navigate and, and really pick out from 200 million hits what is right and appropriate for their child? Well, the first thing, and the National Autism Center is actually a really great resource for families. Um, They really identify four factors for families to consider when they're selecting treatments. The first and possibly most important is, I shouldn't say most important, but one that's very important is what is the evidence of effectiveness for the intervention? Um, You want to make sure that you have professionals involved that can help to make objective um, database decisions related to the therapies that might be appropriate. And that starts with really good evaluation and assessment. Um, The other factor that's really critical in considering interventions for people on the spectrum is the values and the preferences of the families. We know that not every intervention is going to be appropriate or what a family wants for their child. So you have to take that into consideration as you're really considering the treatments and therapies that you want your child to access. And then you have to take stock and sit down and figure out, do I have the capacity to implement this intervention accurately? Because you know, families and people, we have limited resources, we have limited time, we have limited energy, we have limited money um, to really put towards anything that we choose to do in life. And so that's why really uh, picking those interventions that have a good evidence behind it, that has objective support, um, showing that it can be effective in really addressing the goals that you have for your child is going to be critical because you want to put most of your energy and most of your resources towards those types of interventions. Um, I think what's important to hit on briefly as well is I think hearing evidence-based interventions, it's kind of become a catchphrase. What does that actually mean? Well, what it means is that these interventions have been put through the research ringer. Uh, There's been sufficient amount of studies done to show whether or not the intervention is helpful in addressing whatever targets or symptoms you're trying to address. Um, That can be done in many different ways. Um, But the important thing is that at the end of that research, it really goes through the scrutiny and it's looked at by other professionals in the area to kind of say, hey, this study looks good. It it kind of flowed. It it was well designed. And we are very confident in the outcomes of the study. Um, But it doesn't just stop there. You also have to see that these interventions have been tried by others who are not part of the development team. So you want it to you want to see evidence that those outcomes have been replicated by other people. And that's really what forms the basis of a good evidence-based intervention. Here at the Bose Center, um, we provide uh, three major therapies that are often recommended for kids on the spectrum, applied behavior analysis and a focused intervention type. Um, We also provide speech therapy services and occupational therapy. And each of these interventions really work to address some of those core symptoms of an autism spectrum disorder. I'll talk a little bit about ABA in general because that's what my training is in, but um, you know, it's really important that you figure out what works for your family. You figure out what you're able to um, really accommodate as far as it goes with therapies and whatnot, and then take a look at that evidence. And you know, remember that word of mouth or hearing other people say that things helped them um, may not be the place to start, it doesn't mean that some of those therapies that don't have that research base behind them won't eventually be shown to be effective, but we just don't know at this point. And so the best course of action that you can take is really to put your resources towards the things that we do know has a good solid evidence base behind it. Thank you. That was a lot of information or a lot of really rich information about um, the things that the Bow Center offers. Um, What are some common myths that you hear associated with autism or with the treatments that are available? 
Sure. So I think um, one of the biggest things you hear are, are definitely some myths about applied behavior analysis or ABA therapy. And I feel like it's important to briefly talk about that here because it is um, one of the interventions that's recommended first as a first line of treatment for individuals on the spectrum because of the vast amount of research support that, that exists for that particular therapy. Um, I think um, to do that, the best way is just to kind of talk about what ABA is. And at the at the, the foundation of applied behavior analysis, it's basically just what we know about behavior, how behaviors start, and then how they continue to happen and why. And then we take that information and we can use it to address skills deficits. So things that maybe a person should be doing, but they're not already doing that are critical um, life skills moving forward. And we can also take that information and use it to figure out how we can get behaviors that are harmful to the person to go away. And for me, that's the threshold um, of any intervention um, that's targeting getting a behavior to stop is, is it harmful to the person? And so um, that's important to keep in mind. I also think um, that good ABA programs are going to have high levels of caregiver involvement. They're going to really want to focus on goals that are important to the family and important to the person moving forward. Um, it shouldn't be about anyone telling them this is what you need to work on. It's working together to figure out what the ap appropriate course of action is as it relates to the intervention. A good ABA practice is going to be person-centered. So it's going to really look at what the specific needs are for the individual. Um, and it really should be developmental appropriate. We want to make sure that we're not providing therapy in a way that kind of goes against what a person is supposed to be doing at that stage in their life anyway. And so through that, really good ABA programs use, um, you know, definitely direct teaching strategies, but oftentimes you can really build those teaching strategies into the natural routines and activities a person does anyway providing that level of support within uh, an early childhood center, for example, where you can really help to develop the skills that they need while also making sure that they have access to the settings that, um, that are gonna be helpful for them. You know, oftentimes good programs will have a combination of some distraction-free teaching where maybe it is a little bit more targeted one-on-one, -on -one, um, but it doesn't mean that it has to be bland or uh, devoid of any like fun stuff because it really should still involve those things because um, who wants to be part of an intervention that's not fun? or engaging. Um, so I, I just think it's important to remember that that's really what ABA is. It's not synonymous with one thing. Um, I think oftentimes it kind of gets lumped in as this, this very specific thing. It's just, it's a, it's, it's a lot of things and it can be applied in many different ways. And practices and strategies from applied behavior analysis have act absolutely been incorporated to many different interventions that are out there um, right now. And off the top of my head, I think of the Denver start model, where it really is a combination of developmental intervention um, with strategies from applied behavior analysis that's used to teach and support the, the behaviors and the progress of the person. Right. And I love, you know, kind of your um, explanation that it's a, a broader term, you know, it's more all encompassing than people think. I also want to talk about how, you know, caring for a child with autism is a holistic approach. You know, it's what happens in the Bow Center, but it's also what happens at home in the pediatrician's office, at school with their teachers. Can you explain to me how a parent goes through that process and how to coordinate care amongst all these different people? So I think that is something um, that is one of the biggest goals of the Bow Center is to really provide a more integrated um, type of care. I think the autism assessment clinic is a great example of that by really getting different disciplines involved um, that we know are critical towards 
um, the intervention and treatment and, and really just the pathway of um, moving forward once you have that autism diagnosis. What I would encourage parents to do is, is you know, really learn about everything um, that's being recommended to you. Be the advocate that you need to be for your child um, and advocate for that interaction. If you have people that are working with your child or providing medical care or whatnot, really talk with them and say, hey, can you get in contact with this other therapist? I think it would be important for you guys to really coordinate care. Um, you know, hopefully within the Bow Center, we have really taken those steps forward to be able to provide that level of integrated care. I know for me personally, what drew me to the Bow Center as a professional was exactly that ability. I can hop over a couple of doors to our developmental pediatrician, for example, and say, hey, here's what's going on. Do you have any advice? I'm often down in um, the Ashram Therapy and Wellness section talking about occupational therapy and things that I might be seeing in my session and can they give me some information and just some ideas for what I can do to build in and integrate that into my therapy. I speak with our speech therapist often um, similarly related to communication and things like that. So I think it's important for families to really advocate for their providers to reach out to one another and really try to coordinate care um, with the school system. Um, parents uh, should remember that they are allowed to invite anyone they want to participate in IEP meetings and other meetings. And that's a great way to just kind of get people involved um, and, and kind of see in each other. Yeah, it's great that all those resources are really under one roof at Auctioner. Um, that's very helpful for parents. Uh, so switching gears back to the therapy side, we did get a question from one of our viewers. Do y'all have any thoughts on MNRI therapy? And can you explain what that is? I have to admit that I do not recognize what that stands for. So without knowing what it is, I don't want to comment about it. Um, but if they send the full you know, name of that particular therapy, I would love to take a look at it and see what's available. I think now is actually a great time to talk about some resources that are available for families that might help them when they have questions like this about different therapies that maybe they haven't heard of. Um, there's several different organizations out there that kind of keep this ongoing list of all the different therapies that are kind of coming out or being touted um, for autism. And what's really nice about these um, with these resources is that they also provide information about what the evidence of effectiveness is for the different interventions. And they, they do a pretty nice job of keeping up to date with the research support for them. Um, one of the first that comes to mind, I've already mentioned it, is the National Autism Center. They actually um, publish every so many years the um, National Standards Reports, which really goes into detail about different evidence-based interventions or what's the level of evidence for different interventions for autism. Um, the so Association for Science and Autism Treatment is another great website um, that has a link on there where families can really access and look, here's a bunch of different therapies, what are they, um, and then what's the, the level of support for their effectiveness. And then Autism Speaks as well has a great resource on their website related to that. Um, and honestly, the CDC as well, um, you know, all of these, uh, these organizations, they really use good objective information, they follow the research, and it seems like they do a really nice job with updating the information that's available. So that might be a place where they can look for information on that particular therapy. Thank you for that answer. Um, so we got another question from Maria. If I think my child was misdiagnosed, what do I do? There are several things you can do. Uh, first, you can meet with your pediatrician. Two, my first thought when it's a reevaluation is let's start with a consult. You know, I think, you know, if we're speaking about me as the psychologist, I'd like to sit down with the parents. I'd like to see the original report. Now, I'll say some families, when they do a reevaluation, are nervous to share that original report because they don't want to. Um, you know, skew my thinking. Uh, 
but it, it's actually really helpful to have that report to see, well, what did they do? What were the testing conditions? What measures did they use? How did the child respond under these conditions? And that's really informative to see how that child is in that point in time. And then based on that consult, we may decide to move forward with um, another evaluation, which could be done either using similar measures or doing something more observational based. So I think a good place to start is to reach out, schedule an appointment, discuss your concerns. Why do you think it was a misdiagnosis? And then let's plan from there. What are the next steps and what do we need to do to answer your questions? Gotcha. So in that same vein of uh, reevaluation, we got another question that is essentially asking if their child has already been evaluated at another um, healthcare facility, would they need to be reevaluated at Auctioner to receive services from you guys at the Bow Center? No, but we would, it, it is beneficial to see the original reports. We do thorough, thorough chart reviews and record reviews to really learn about your child. What are their strengths? What are their challenges? Knowing their strengths are just as important. Um, so sharing as much information from the previous evaluation is very helpful, but they do not need to receive another evaluation. And I agree. And I, I would also just say that with with any um, evaluation that a child receives, um, you know, different therapies are covered by insurance. Um, there are certain therapies that if you want to look towards that therapy, like applied behavior analysis, for example, the evaluation really has to have um, certain components to it in order for for insurances to authorize that particular intervention. So um, it doesn't necessarily matter where the evaluation comes from. What's more important is the quality of the evaluation and that they have those critical pieces of information that are needed in order to get the different therapies approved. And to follow up on that, one of the reasons I love working at the Bow Center and kind of what drew me there as a professional was this um, multidisciplinary approach. So sometimes a child may come through to see Dr. Lassayer and she'll get the evaluation and maybe certain components are missing. She just comes over to my little cubicle and sticks her head in. We don't need to do a full reevaluation, but we'll identify the missing part. And we're both on the phone with the parent saying, you know, we noticed this part was missing. We think this would be beneficial for your child for X, Y, and Z reasons. May we go ahead and do this? And so it's also a part of us trying to keep an eye out for you too and going through your records and making sure that everything is up to snuff for you and your kid. Uh, and then if there are any gaps, we collaborate as a team. And that might be Dr. Lassayer, myself, um, a speech therapist, one of our developmental behavioral pediatricians, and we'll put together what pieces need to be completed and then ask your permission and share with you our plan and our rationale for our plan. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, you want the parents to be involved every step of the way and for the child's information to be as accurate and robust as possible so that they can get the best service. Um, so, if a parent does suspect that their child might have autism, what are kind of the first steps and then the next steps after that? And also, we got a question from the audience. How long does it take to get an appointment for an evaluation with you guys? So when you start to develop concerns, my first recommendation is go see your pediatrician. Talk to your pediatrician. Your pediatricians, at least I know the pediatricians at Oshner are trained to do um, very specific screeners for autism. And if it comes back with an elevated risk, they're calling us because we're literally the building next door. Um, and then we'll see the child to do a full evaluation if that's what the parents wish to do next. Uh, so your doctor, your, your PCP, your primary care doctor is going to refer you over to the, the Bow Center. At that point, the evaluation starts there. We send you one intake packet that's, it can be a little long, it's a developmental intake, but all those questions, there was a team of us, Dr. Lassayer included, that sat down to make this developmental intake packet. 
Every question in it has a purpose and is important to our evaluation. So the parents fill that out. They send it back. We as a team will sit down and we'll review it and look over it and decide, okay, what kind of evaluation do they need? Uh, so right now, an evaluation timeline, I'm, I'm not sure of the specifics on there because we just opened the autism assessment clinic. Um, so we are, our capability has increased. So we are moving faster through our wait list. And I wanted to point out too, with the evaluation process that, um, you don't have to wait for a diagnostic evaluation to start to try to get an assessment for related services that might be needed, such as speech therapy or even help through early steps, or um, which is an early intervention program here in Louisiana, or even if your child is age three, really looking through child search through the school system. Um, and what I really want to point out right now as well, because it has come up sometimes when people are looking for therapy services, there is a difference between a medical or clinical evaluation or diagnosis of autism and um, a classification that's provided by the school system. Um, oftentimes when it comes to therapy, insurance companies don't accept the school-based assessment because it really is done, it uses lots of the same measures. It's not to say that school-based assessments aren't thorough, but the purpose of a school-based assessment is to determine whether or not a child meets criteria for a disability category under special education law. That's a little bit different of a purpose than a clinical or medical evaluation for autism. And so just because your child has one or the other does not necessarily mean that they don't also need the other piece of the evaluation. And you can do all of those things simultaneously. You don't have to wait for one to happen in order to get the other uh, kind of ball rolling. Yeah, that's a really great point um, that I think a lot of people maybe aren't aware of that, you know, it doesn't have to be in steps. It can, you can kind of go as you please to get the help that you need. Um, so another question that uh, we got is what screeners do the auctioner pediatricians utilize? And you also mentioned that schools have a certain criteria. So what are they looking for during that appointment? So really, they're looking at this core symptoms of social communication, social interaction, restricted and repetitive behaviors. One of the popular ones they use is the um, MCHAT. So, and they'll even use the MCHAT follow-up. And then we also have several other resources and rating scales that the pediatricians can administer. We also utilize observations from the CARS, the, the Childhood Autism Rating Scale, from the Autism Spectrum Rating Scale. Um, so we've been putting together, we have about eight different tools we can use in the beginning before going through with a full evaluation. And I think too, with pediatrician or visits to your pediatrician due to concerns about a possible autism spectrum disorder, keep in mind that you know, your doctor, they have a limited amount of time that they're going to be able to interact with your child. So while they're constantly looking for those behaviors that you see for, from a typical development perspective, are they meeting those milestones? They recognize that some kids maybe just you know, it's a new setting. It's it's a t totally different place. Maybe um, they're not showing them the, the things that they really can do. And so the amount of information that a parent can provide to the pediatrician is really critical. And that's why it's always really important. If you notice something that just seems a little bit off, really talk to them about it. Let them know specifically what's going on. Let them know if what they're seeing in your appointment is what you see at home, because they can can only make referrals and help you get supports based on the information and the data that they gather through their office visits. And so a family's input becomes really uh, critical in that uh, context. If your child happens to be enrolled in early steps because there's maybe some delays you've noted in, in areas of development, 
Um, they will also do a screener called the biscuit um, that is geared towards identifying whether or not someone um, has symptoms of a spectrum disorder. So that's just another point of entry, I guess, where, where somebody's kind of looking and screening for possible spectrum related symptoms. Thank you for that. Um, so you mentioned earlier that uh, a lot of insurances cover some of the treatment options, but can we talk about other financial assistance that's available? We've gotten a few questions about that in the comments. So I believe so, that we have a department here at Oscar ahead, that can work with families to figure out um, other financial options if their insurance does not cover a therapy that you think is important um, for them. So I would encourage, again, speak with your primary providers to, to ask what assistance is available through our system, because I know that we do have a mechanism within the Oshner system um, that can help facilitate um, any challenges with that. Great, thank you for that information. There's oh, also, you know, people can sign up for Medicaid, um, especially after they get a diagnosis. Um, there are, you know, if you go to Autism Speaks or the National Autism Association, there is information on um, waivers, um, scholarships, especially things for like camp. You know, there are specialized camps that can sometimes get a little pricey, but you can fill out for scholarships. Um, that is something we do try and assist with after a diagnosis is rendered, you know, setting a family up with a social worker to talk about what are the top resources that you need to get connected with that are going to help you um, financially, socially, especially with social support in case parents need another community, need another set of parents who have walked this path to see what it's like. Um, so those are and things to pick we try you to I was going to, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt and jump in, but I was going to piggyback a little bit and say that within Louisiana, one really important resource that families um, of uh, of a child with any type of developmental disability should take advantage of is through the Office for Citizens with Developmental Disabilities. Um, if you're enrolled in Early Steps, your Early Steps service coordinator should be talking to you about um, the entry process for that particular organization. Um, but what a lot of people don't realize is that you can actually start that process with OCDD as early as two years, nine months. And so the earlier you can get that process started to determine if you meet criteria um, for that particular service, the better, because that's what's going to open up opportunities in the future. I think a lot of people hear about waiver supports um, and things like that. Well, that is something that you get by being determined to be eligible for services through OCDD. The earlier you start that process, the earlier on the wait list you'll be. Um, and there is a significant wait list for those types of waiver supports. But what a lot of people don't realize is that you want to be on that list as early as possible so that by the time you probably really need those services, and I'm thinking more of like supported living for older individuals with disabilities, you don't want to have just gotten involved with the system. You want to be with the system as early as possible. There's also sometimes other resources that are available just by being determined eligible for OCDD. Um, and you can really work with your local Local human services and authority to figure out, are there other supports available for me and my family? Sometimes that involves financial supports. Other times it involves maybe child care type supports that don't necessarily fall under the waivers, um, but that are available as long as you qualify for services through OCDD. So um, I don't think families often know about that service, or maybe they do, but they're just not quite sure what exactly it is. But it is really important for them to kind of take advantage um, of that particular service available here in Louisiana. That's great. The more resources, the better, I feel like, if, if I was a parent. Um, so this is really great information. Um, I had another question related to therapy. So let's say that a child gets a diagnosis at a very early age, you know, under five years old. Do they need to continue therapy throughout the rest of their life? Like how long um, 
will therapy happen for? And then let's say they do. And once they age out and, you know, turn 18, are there resources for adults that are similar to those for children? So I think that's the, the question of the uh, century. <laughs> um, I, you know, the, the short answer to that is that therapy should continue as long as the child has areas or the person has areas that are in need of support. Um, I, you know, there's certain skills that once you develop them, you have them and therapy related to that particular skill um, can be stopped. Um, one that I'm thinking that is probably going to be a lifelong kind of, not, I don't want to say challenge, but something that might present itself over time is really related to social skills. And if you think about it, um, our social skills that we need to have, it changes throughout our lifetime. So the social skills we need to have as a three-year-old are gonna look so different than the social skills we need to have as a 13-year-old compared to the social skills we need to have as a 30-year-old. And so that's an area where you often see a need for continued therapy in some fashion, um, or at least continued support in some fashion. It's really hard to put a hard stop on therapy because it, it really should be tailored to the needs of the person uh, and the needs of the family and what their goals are. And so therapy is often stopped when you're meeting the goals that you have set up. Um, but it should always be continually evaluated through the lens of what the needs of the individual is. And that goes for, I know with ABA, a lot of people hear about, we want that 40 hour a week program. Um, but what we really want to do is take a look at what are the true needs of the person, because not everybody's going to technically need that 40 hour a week program. Um, there might be other ways that we can provide that same type of therapy be at a lesser intensity and still be beneficial, but it really needs to be determined and based on the skill set of the person. And if you think about it, it makes sense because um, to give a medical analogy, if you're getting antibiotics for um, strep throat, you're not going to give the same dose of penicillin to every person that comes in with strep throat. It's going to really be tailored to a lot of factors for that individual. And I think therapy for autism really needs to follow that same model. Unfortunately, we don't really have a way to prescribe specific therapy hours. We don't yet know how much intervention is needed um, for any particular individual. Hopefully we will get there sooner rather than later. Um, but in the meantime, I think it really is going to be highly dependent on the skills that a person needs to develop and what the goals of the family is for their child. Yeah, thank you so much for that answer. So my last question, you know, a lot of people who are connected to autism might have noticed that what used to be Autism Awareness Month has kind of shifted to Autism Acceptance Month. How important is it that we change that word while, you know, awareness is still very important, the acceptance part of it for anyone who has autism or anyone who might ever come into contact with someone with autism, how important is that acceptance factor? It's huge. And acceptance is greater than awareness. Acceptance is, you know, awareness falls under that umbrella. So you might be aware, but are you actively working to be supportive, accepting, encouraging? Um, and I think it's huge for the families and especially the parents. You know, the parents, when I talk to them, especially at the feedback, their concern is, school. Is my kid going to have friends? Are they going to be accepted? Is he going to be bullied? And I think by shifting our mindset from awareness to acceptance, parents can begin to feel more comforted. Kids can start to feel more accepted. And, you know, I work with a lot of kids on the autism spectrum and they're aware. They're aware of what's going on at school. They know if they're fitting in, they know if they're not fitting in. But where they're struggling is how to repair it, how to read the social nuances, the social cues, especially when they get to those preteen years and teenage years where things are, um, they're not so 
outwardly spoken and it's more the facial expressions and the body language. And that's where, you know, they start to really notice some struggle and they feel that. So I think acceptance is more important, not just for um, the adults in our community, but also educating peers and our children about autism and autism acceptance. I agree. And I think that the awareness has really helped to get us to this point of acceptance. So for so long, um, myself included, before I started doing what I'm doing, I had this kind of preconceived idea about what autism is or isn't. And I think there's lots of stereotypes that exist out there. And we've said it repeatedly throughout our our day to day, but it really is a spectrum and, you know, no two individuals necessarily kind of present in the same way. Um, And isn't that just like how we are in general in life? I mean, no two people are the same. And so you have to learn to accept the differences. um, And and really, I feel like it's going to help towards more inclusion. Um, it's, it's helping to bring acceptance that these people are going to need a little bit more support to really be able to do all the things that their peers are doing. And that's, that's so important for them. Yeah, thank you both. Um, I just want to remind everyone out there that even though April is Autism Acceptance Month, uh, it doesn't end, you know, at the end of April. This is really an ongoing thing, developing awareness and acceptance of autism. And I could talk to you both all day long. Um, You both had a wealth of knowledge on this and are great, great resources for our parents and our patients. So thank you both for being here today. Um, If you have any more questions that we didn't get to, put those in the comments and we'll get Dr. Anadi and Dr. Lasser to answer those later. Um, For more information on the Bow Center, visit auction.org slash bow. And we'll also put Dr. Anadi and Dr. Lasser's Find a Doctor profiles in the comment section so that you can access that for more information on them. Thank you both again for being here. Thank Thank you, you. Taylor. I really enjoyed this. Great. Bye, you guys. Bye.